seated. As we look into God's word once again, we are reminded that he is our heavenly father. It's wonderful to have a day like Father's Day. We've celebrated Mother's Day recently with Brother Jerry Gardner, and now we have the privilege of looking at some passages of scripture that deal with God as our Father. And the question is, who is your Father? Very important question, and here in the world there are uh, many who pride themselves in who their Father was, or who their Father is. They pride themselves in being fathers, delighted to uh, tell about their children, and you've all heard me tell about my children. Those of you who have children, you're delighted to tell about your children. It's a wonderful blessing. Now we move into that stage of life when we're grandfathers and we tell about our grandchildren. And perhaps some of us can tell about our great-grandchildren as well. Children tend to be identified with their fathers. Oh, his dad is the chief of police. Oh, his dad teaches down there at the elementary school. Oh, his dad is, um, oh, he's behind bars right now. And we have empathy for that kind of a child. Children tend to be identified with their fathers. Children also tend to identify themselves with their fathers. Many years ago, when my wife and I lived in Israel, my wife overheard a conversation between two little boys. The first little boy was boasting about his father and said something to the effect, my father is a member of the Knesset, which is roughly the same thing as saying my father is a United States senator or representative. That's nothing, replied the second little boy. My father is an Egged bus driver. That was quite a deal in Israel. Egged bus company is the biggest bus company in the land. That little boy was very proud of the fact that his father was an Egged bus driver. Who a father is can help and benefit his children in the temporal realm. Or it can hinder and eliminate their chances for success, except at very great odds. For example, the very average child of a wealthy donor who has just paid for a new building at Harvard will probably find it easier getting into Harvard than the very average child of a city sanitation worker. Fathers make a difference in the lives of their children. Ungodly fathers, fathers who reject the authority of the Bible, absentee fathers, irresponsible fathers, drug-addicted fathers, alcoholic fathers, lustful and philandering fathers, lazy sleep-in fathers, welfare system fathers, cruel fathers, lying and deceitful fathers, proud fathers, angry fathers, cursing and blasphemous fathers, and ignoramus, we think education is stupid fathers, tend to send a certain message to their children, and their children tend to reflect the same characteristics as they grow to maturity. That's not always the case, but it tends to be the norm. Were it not for the sovereign grace of God reaching down and saving some of those children, the natural tendencies of the flesh would be to drag all of the children from such fathers to a more reprobate and evil set of actions ending in hell. On the other hand, godly fathers, fathers who exalt the scripture in their lives and practice, fathers who reflect our Lord Jesus Christ, faithful fathers, diligent fathers, kind fathers, honest fathers, self-controlled fathers, hard-working fathers, fathers who provide for their families, fathers who control their tongues, fathers who value education and discipline, and fathers who are faithful to their wives, likewise send a different message to their children. And their children tend to reflect the same characteristics as they grow to maturity. It's not always so. 
Because the world, the flesh, and the devil fight vigorously against the godly influence of godly fathers, but it does tend to be the norm. You know, the same is true in the spiritual realm. The Bible makes it very clear. If you stop and think about it, as we said a few moments ago in the prayer, God has chosen the title Father to describe himself in relation to believers whom he calls his children. He has many other titles, but this is the most intimate, personal title for the first member of the Godhead. He perfectly portrays what a father is supposed to be like. He manifests all the true characteristics of a father. He is not ashamed to call himself our father, just like Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren. Brethren are children of the same father. In the New Testament alone, not counting the Old Testament, the word brethren shows up 231 times. The concept of the family relationship to the same father is a very significant teaching of Christ and the apostles. Just like physical brothers will have the same character qualities and physical similarity features to their earthly father, spiritual brothers will also have similar character qualities and moral features to their heavenly father and to their elder brother, in this case Jesus Christ and it will be a reflection of their holy position and calling. Jesus calls us his brethren. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 11 and 12, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. That is speaking of Christ calling us brethren. He is the one who sanctifies. We are the ones who are sanctified. It is a holy relationship with our heavenly Father who is holy. Hebrews 2.17, five verses later. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Our Lord Jesus Christ took upon him flesh and blood, born sinless through the virgin birth, lived a perfect and sinless life, died as our substitutionary sacrifice on Calvary's cross to pay for our sins because he loves us as his brethren. I think most of us here who truly love our brothers and sisters would be willing to die for them. Our Lord Jesus Christ did that for us. And he came at the will of the Father to deliver us. That's the family relationship that God has in his mercy extended to you and to me. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 12 verse 50, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. One of the characteristic qualities of those who are children if they are obedient children, is they do the will of their father. Who is your father? Do you manifest it in the way that you do his will? Whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. But there are some who are not of the heavenly father, they're growing up, they're even in churches, they're planted in their pews, they show up on Sunday morning, but they are not saved. Just because they are in a church building does not mean they're one of 
the Heavenly Father's children. Jesus said that in Matthew 15, 13. He answered and said, Every plant which my Heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. That brings us to the second observation. God is not the only one in the Bible who is called Father. Listen to what Jesus said. I speak that, and this is John chapter 8, beginning in verse 38. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. You see, children tend to reflect their parents. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. In the spiritual realm there are two fathers. There is God the Father, and those who know him as their father will reflect his character qualities. Those who have been born again, that is, born from above, born of the Father, will reflect what the Heavenly Father is like. But those who have not been born again, but have only been born into this fleshly realm, already have a spiritual father. And that's the devil. And you know what? They will manifest what their father in the spiritual realm is like. They will reject Christ, as did those who were speaking to our Lord here in John chapter 8. They will be filled with lusts. As Jesus says, that is what comes from Satan. They will have hatred and Hatred results in murder, and Satan was a murderer from the beginning. They will not abide in the truth. They will be liars, and they will be deceivers, for they are of their father, the devil. As with the word brethren, the word father is also very prominent in the New Testament. It occurs even more times than brethren, registering in it about 369 times. There are two spiritual fathers that are dealt with as we move through the New Testament, and I didn't even count the number of times that word occurs in the Old Testament. Two hundred some for brethren, three hundred sixty-nine for fathers. So the real question is, who is your father? Who is your father? The children of the Heavenly Father will act one way. The children of the devil will act a different way. As Jesus put it in John 10, 37, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. You see, the thing that supported his message was the fact that he obeyed the Heavenly Father. He did the works that the Father had sent him to do. You see, that reflects over to us as well as we move into the New Testament. And I'm not going to give you all 369 references. Um, I had five people complain that last Sunday evening the message was too long. So I'm only going to give you 368 of them. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. What kind of things should we do? If we would reflect Christ, Jesus tells us, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
In verse 45 he says, That you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. He's telling us there to be kind even to those who persecute us. In verse 48 he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's teleos, the Greek word that means mature. Responding in the appropriate manner. In chapter 6, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. The Father is one who gives rewards for things that are done for his glory and not for our own glory. In verse 4 he says, That thine alms may be in secret, that thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And it's true not only of the almsgiving, but also of our prayer life. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You know, I often hear people praying, Dear Lord Jesus, that's an unbiblical prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ said we're to pray to the Father. He himself prayed to the Father. The Apostle Paul said we're to pray to the Father, and he prayed to the Father. We find multiple illustrations of this throughout Scripture. We never once find anybody praying to Jesus, nor do we find exhortations to pray to Jesus. We are to pray to our Father, which is in heaven. You yourself know by rote the Lord's Prayer. It doesn't say, O Jesus, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's an unbiblical prayer to be addressing our prayers to Jesus. We address them to the Heavenly Father, and the Heavenly Father is the one who provides for us. You see, that's one of the character qualities of a father. He hears the weeping petitions of his dearly beloved children. He meets their needs. He tells them no when it's necessary to do so. But he more than delights to give us the good things which we request. Our Father, which art in heaven, we don't have to give vain repetitions. Jesus tells us that in verse 8 of chapter 6. Be not ye therefore like unto them, speaking of the pagans, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Oh, there are so many passages. If you go through the Gospels, Jesus is continually talking about the Father. I'm going to even skip some of the ones that I've written down here, but there are dozens more that I have not written down. But our Lord Jesus Christ goes on from giving alms and prayer, then he talks about fasting. And he says, That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. He's a God who meets our needs, the Father. Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bonds. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He doesn't give us what's bad for us. He gives us what's good. Chapter 7. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Men... The Heavenly Father is the prime example for you and for me who are fathers. Look at all the references in Scripture to God the Father. It will tell you what we are supposed to be reflecting. Yes, we know we're supposed to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ, for He perfectly reflected the Heavenly Father. And we'll look at those verses in a few moments, the Lord willing. But the Heavenly Father is the one who sets the example as a father to us in the way in which he meets our needs. But you know, just using the right words is not enough. Suppose some child that I'd never seen before came up to me and said, um, I know I'm supposed to ask my father to support me. So, Father, will you support me? Is that child my child? Do I have an obligation to support him? The answer to both questions is no. And Jesus said so in Matthew 7:21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father 
which is in heaven, using the right words is not the way in which God becomes your Father and Jesus becomes your Lord. It's a matter of faith in Christ alone. And suddenly you enter into the kingdom of the Heavenly Father. You're transferred from darkness to light. You're transferred from death to life. Those who know the Lord Jesus Christ will confess him openly as their Lord and Savior. And then he, in response, will confess us before the Father. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. There are multiple passages of scripture that's where Jesus makes it clear that obedience to the will of the Father is proof of sonship or daughtership to the Father. Jesus tells us this, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. We all know John chapter 14, verses 6 and following. It's a marvelous passage of scripture. And as we look at that passage of scripture, we discover that there are a number of wonderful and blessed things that we're told. We have the great promise of heaven. We often hear verses 1 through 6 preached as we go to funerals. But verse 7 goes on. Not only does Jesus promise us a house in heaven where he's come to, to receive us, but in John 14, 7 he says, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me? He that hath seen, the fa hath seen me hath seen the Father. Oh, what a marvelous truth. Jesus perfectly reveals the Heavenly Father to us. What a great and precious and blessed truth that is. We find that obedience to Christ, therefore, is obedience to the Heavenly Father. Obedience to Christ is proof of our relationship to the Heavenly Father. In verse 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he shall be loveth me, shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my saying, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Obedience to Christ is obedience to the Father. Suppose your father, imagine yourself as a child with an older sibling, sends the older sibling and says, Dad says, come home right now, it's time for dinner. And you say to your older sibling, I don't have to obey you because you're not my father. But the message that the older sibling is carrying is a message from the father. So when you disobey, you are not disobeying merely an older sibling. You are disobeying your heavenly father. And that's what we find our Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Read John 14, 15, and 16. That's the upper room discourse. That's what Jesus tells the disciples 
just before he goes to the cross. This is the last time of in-depth teaching that he has with them, and the emphasis is on their relationship to the Father through obedience to the Son. We know the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The father in that story represents to us God the Father. The prodigal son represents the son who has walked away from the father and wasted his inheritance. And there are many who have wasted their inheritance. They are still children of the father, but they waste their inheritance. And someday they will have to come back and the father will receive them back. But they will have no inheritance. We have a Heavenly Father like that. He's a Father who loves us as His children. He wants to be reconciled with us. He's provided the means of reconciliation through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Are you reflecting your Heavenly Father or are you wandering among the pagans and wallowing in the pigsty eating the husks of corn. Christ perfectly reveals the Father, so imitating and obeying Him shows that relationship to the Father. He perfectly reveals the Father. John tells us that in John 1.18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared Him. John 5, 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I'm reading a book currently called Like Father, Like Son. It's a somewhat humorous book written by an unbeliever, but a lot of really good insights into what it means to be a father, and he expresses it very articulately with the fact that he has two little children, one of whom went through open heart surgery when he was only a few months old. And the uh, agony that he felt going through that operation, you know, waiting to see what would be the results. A man who didn't know the peace of Christ, a man who didn't know the, the love of God, a man but yet who loved his son and saw the suffering that that little baby was going through. Interesting book. The son sees his father and copies his father. Jesus says that of himself here in terms of the heavenly father. How much more should we be earnestly desiring to be like our heavenly father if we know him, if we love him, if we look up to him, if we understand how he provides for us in everything and loves us so much. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Oh, how many passages of Scripture tell us that our relationship to the Father comes through the Son, Jesus Christ. The Father is sovereign in salvation, and unbelievers do not have the Spirit-empowered likeness when they try to imitate our Heavenly Father. It's not genuine. The Father is sovereign in salvation. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6.39, This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. As the Father gives the seed of life to his wife, which produces children, so the Heavenly Father has given the seed of his word into the heart of those who are his elect, and he brings forth fruit, life. Wonderful pictures that Jesus gives to us. 
In verse 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And it's a secure relationship. It's a relationship which cannot be broken just as children are always going to be descended from their father no matter whether they change their names, no matter whether they move to a foreign country, no matter whether they live or die, they are still his children. Even so it is with us. It's a permanent relationship. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. John 10, 29 and 30. The Father keeps his promises to his children. We'll go over just one of those. That is the promise of the Holy Spirit given on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, this is Jesus, just prior to the ascension, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. And then we find Peter preaching it after the day of Pentecost occurs in the opening verses of Acts chapter 2. And the Spirit of God is given, and we find the day of Pentecost, and a new work of God is beginning on that day. Peter preaches, and he says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, that is, Jesus Christ, having ascended, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. How many promises are there in the Word of God to you? God, if he is your Father, always keeps his promises. Men, do you keep your promises to your children? Or do you sort of make off-the-cuff promises just to get them out of your hair? Yeah, 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 I'll do that, sure. You, you know, just wait a while, wait a while. I'll get to it, I'll get to it. The Heavenly Father always keeps his promises. That is an illustration for us dads of how we should keep our promises to our children as well. The Father is in control of prophetic history. He plans and executes His plan. Oh, how we thank God that He is in control. Jesus answers them. They say, Lord, without this time restore the kingdom unto Israel. And Jesus answers them and He says, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. It is the Father who has ordained the course of history and its times. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Ephesians 4, 6, One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. That's one Father. But the other father that we mentioned, and we only will speak of him briefly, is the devil, and the devil's children act a different way. John 15, he that hateth me hateth my father also. Verse 24, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not sinned. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. This is the group that he told a few chapters earlier, you're of your father the devil. These are the things that they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. He's prophesying the persecution to come. First John 2, 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. It will be those who deny who Jesus is and what he did. They are not children of the Father. They are liars. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. There are doctrinal tests that are involved in whether or not someone is truly a child of the Heavenly Father. There are moral tests as well as the doctrinal tests. We find whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The children of God versus the children of the devil. The heavenly Father versus the satanic Father. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And you've heard me say before, there are three tests 
of the true believer in 1 John. Number one is the doctrine of Christ, who Jesus is and what he did. Number two is love of the brethren. Number three is the godly lifestyle. Those are three things that demonstrate our relationship, according to 1 John, with the one who is our Heavenly Father. Satan is the one who leads us into temptation. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It's Satan who does the temptations, not God. Listen to James 1.13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Dear friends, who is your father? Who is the one whom you are imitating? Who is the one whom you love? Who is the one whom you serve? Oh, we could many passages in Acts where different ones who are involved in occult activities and so on are told that they are children of the devil. For example, Acts chapter 13, and said, O full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not seek to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Paul calls him a child of the devil. The devil is seeking to make believers look like his children. Paul writes that to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 6, and 7, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. He goes on in 2 Timothy, he speaks of those who have been captured by Satan, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. They have yielded so many times to the lusts of the flesh that Satan knows that any time he wants to annul their testimony, all he does is have to dangle that temptation in front of them. They'll fall for it, and they've just ruined their testimony. He's our enemy. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We've already spoken about how we as Christians are supposed to address God as our Father. I have maybe 25 references on that here. We'll move past those. We have, if I can see the clock correctly, just run out of time. Let me just give you a couple of very brief thoughts to go home with. When I was in law school, I knew a Christian girl who had truly personalized this issue of claiming God as her father. I mean, she personalized it. She had a very unpleasant and very ungodly earthly father. So whenever she spoke about God, she said, my Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, not the Heavenly Father, or not just God, my Heavenly Father. She clung in tenacious faith to the fact that she personally had a loving Heavenly Father, no matter what her earthly situation was. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the Hebrew word for Daddy. And those of you who know us know that our children call us Abba and Ima, Daddy and Mommy, because we met in Israel. Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Oh, we could go on. Being children of the Heavenly Father requires acts of mercy, because our Heavenly Father is merciful. Being children of the Heavenly Father requires separation. I wish we had time to cover that one. Being children of the Heavenly Father requires holy living. The Father desires fellowship with His children. Worldliness proves that we don't love the Heavenly Father. Being children of the Heavenly Father requires reverent worship. A reverent attitude, by the way, is also required of children to their earthly fathers. Being children of the Heavenly Father requires us to be thankful. Many, many passages of Scripture. I'm just giving you the headings of those things that we do not have time to cover. God the Father is involved in directing our steps each day. Good fathers discipline and chasten their children as God disciplines and chastens his children. God the Father keeps his children secure. What a marvelous truth that is. And so the question remains in closing, who is your father? And the second question, is there 
anything in your life to prove it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the great and precious privilege it is to call you Father. You are our Father. And each of us who knows Jesus as our Savior can say, You are my Father. And how we love you as a child loves his father. And how you love us, your children, as a father loves his children. Thank you for reminding us of that personal, intimate, eternal relationship that you have given to us through faith in your Son who paid the full penalty for our sins on Calvary's cross and was buried and rose again. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.